Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Galatians, please, chapter 5. Finishing on that series I've taught on faith. And this last um, evidence of faith I wanted to mention is Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. And I, I want to try, by the help and grace of God, to put a thought together. I, I have spent, honestly, a lot of time thinking through this, trying to uh, express it as it ought to be expressed. And I'm going to give a little bit of an attempt at that here this afternoon, I know, by God's grace. Verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. Too many times we see faith as in a contradiction to the law. That we have the law in the Old Testament, faith and grace in the New Testament, and somehow those two don't match. And, and we get a lot of times folks want to throw out the Old Testament, but, uh, and we just, we're living under faith, we're living under grace, and those old, that Old Testament law, none of that, you know, we have to worry about. But the Bible says here that the faith we have works by love. Romans tells us that we do not void the law by faith, but by faith we establish the law. Now, what is this idea that faith works by love? It's the idea of this. First of all, I want you to see this, that faith works. Faith works. Now, I don't mean that in the sense, and you can take it that way, but there is in the sense, yeah, faith is successful or faith will bring success. We use that word works sometimes. Well, you know, uh, you do this because it works. I don't mean it that way. I mean it this way. Faith is active. Faith works. It's not lazy. Faith doesn't sit and do nothing. Faith doesn't just scheme. Faith doesn't just dream. Faith doesn't just talk about ideas. Faith works. Faith works by love. But faith, the first thing you've got to understand is faith works. That's what James said. Don't tell me that you've got faith and you don't have works. He said, I'll show you my faith by my works. You show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. So the first thing you have to understand about faith is that faith is not inactive. It's not passive. People of faith are working. People of faith are doing. People of faith are doing and involved in good works and obeying and honoring God. But the difference between faith and the law is this. Faith is obeying God. Faith is working. Faith is obeying the law. But it is doing it through love. Not through its own energy. Faith works by love. So that the things that you and I do, when we trust God, we obey God, and we fulfill that obedience through a heart of love. Our motivation for obeying God and for doing the law is love. Now, I want to go down here for a little bit, and let's go a little bit further because we'll see something that's happening. In this passage, uh, verse 6, verse 7, what's he telling these folks? Now, we know what's happened in the churches of Galatia. They have been called to Christ by faith. They've received the Spirit by faith. They've received Christ by faith. And now they're turning from that to perfect it in the flesh. And they've had these Judaizers that have come in telling them, you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the whole law in order to make your salvation complete. And Paul says, no way. No way. No. When you got the Holy Ghost, did you get the Holy Ghost because you, when you got saved, first of all, when you got Christ, did you get Christ because you obeyed the law or because you believed? Because you believed, Paul said. Did you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith or the works of the law? Did God give you the Holy Ghost because you have obeyed a law? Or did He give you the Holy Ghost because you believed Him? He said He gave you the Holy Ghost because you believed Him. That's why. You took Him at His word and He gave you the promise. Now you can't perfect in the flesh what you started in the Spirit. And now you're going to take all of that and He makes this statement. Verse 4, chapter 5 and verse 4. Christ is become of no effect. I'm sorry, I'm going back to chapter verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, and that was one of the main things they were wanting, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. 
Christ has become of no effect unto you because of you, or whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. The question is whether you're going to be justified by faith or justified by obedience to the law. And he says, if you're justified by obedience to the law, you can't just keep part of it. You've got to do it all. If you're going to say, I've got to be circumcised, then you're going to have to eat the meats of the law. You're going to have to do, uh, fulfill the sacrificial things. You have to keep all the feasts. You can't just do it in part. You've got to do it in all. If you are going to be justified by the law, then you've got to obey every jot and tittle of the law. Because the only way you can be justified by the law is perfect adherence and perfect obedience to every aspect of the law. And Paul said, first of all, that's never happened. And it's not going to happen. Now, I'm going to tell you why here in just a moment. But notice, verse 4, Christ has become of no effect of you. Whosoever of you are justified by law, you're fallen by grace. It's fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now it comes down to verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Paul says now even in doing this, you're disobeying the truth. The truth came to you about Jesus Christ. You're turning from Christ, going back to the law. You're disobeying truth. Who did this to you? Where did this persuasion come from? It didn't come from one that called you. It's come from someone else. That's a little leaven and it's leavening the whole lump. Now... He talks to them. Um, let me go on down a little bit. Oh, this. I'll just keep reading. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Now, he's been talking about this business of being troubled. That's what's happened. There are those among you who are troubling you. And uh, he even ends it with that kind of a mindset. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. And that's what they've had. Men have come among them and are troubling them. Look at back at chapter 1 and verse 7. He says that, which is not another, there's someone that's come, called you to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That word trouble there means to agitate you. They're bringing in arguments. They're, they're uh, causing an inward commotion. They're taking away your calmness and your, your peace and your tranquility. And they brought this other kind of doctrine. That's what false doctrine does. It'll stir you up and trouble you from true doctrine. And he says, these that trouble you, he said, I have confidence that in back to chapter six, five and verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Paul said, whoever it is that's troubling you, bringing false doctrine and seeking to take you back to the law, he will bear his judgment. And now, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. It's really hard for me to express how strong a language Paul just said to get it. When he said cut off, these are guys promoting circumcision. Paul said, I, instead of just circumcising, I wish they just, that they were just cut off. And he literally meant that. That their private parts were just cut off all entirely. Now that's what he said. I know that's plain, but that's what he meant. And that's what he said. And, and he wasn't just talking about them getting that rid of. He said, all they can do is go around talking about circumcision. Paul said, I'd really rather put it to them. Uh, and, but anyway, okay, I, I just wanted you to get the sense of that. It's a little hard to say and not, not in any way try to disgrace this place. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now I want you to understand a picture of what's happened. Here are people who have received Christ by faith. They've received the Holy Ghost by faith. They've gotten delivered from their sin. They're filled with the love of God. They're obeying God. They're honoring His Word. They're loving one another. They're living in harmony and unity. But they're not circumcised. They're not keeping ceremonial practices of the law. They're not going to the Jewish feast. They're not headed up to Jerusalem. They're not going to the temple. And they're, they're uh, not uh, eating, uh, following the dietary laws of the Old Testament. But they're loving God. They're loving one another. 
And then come these Judaizers from some somewhere, and they tell them, say, well, that's nice, you accepted Christ, Christ is a Jew, you've got saved, but I'm going to tell you something right now, if you're going to complete your salvation, you need to keep the whole law, you need to be circumcised, you need to identify with this thing. Father Abraham, he's the father of faith, uh, he's the father of this religion anyway, so look, you need to take the same mark that God gave him, and you need to be circumcised, separate yourself, get away from that world, separate yourself, put the mark of it in, you you need this mark. You need to identify yourself. We need to show this world who we are and you need to be circumcised in order for you to complete your salvation and to show that you're, you're, you're a saint of God. Well, what happens is we got this conflict. And what happens is, is they begin, and Paul mentions it down there, verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. They're causing divisions, they're fussing, and, and what they're doing is basically this doctrine which is, is of the flesh instead of the spirit gets in there and causes this conflict. People uh, more concerned about glorying in the flesh and following circumcision, more concerned about an outward appearance. I'm not talking about moral, modest appearance. I'm talking about some outward sign of their Christianity. Then they are the inward power of the Holy Ghost to live right and to have God dwelling within. They're more concerned about some show. They're more concerned about how they can impress their Jewish uh, friends with, with an outward show. And what it's causing is this kind of conflict of flesh and spirit. And you notice that's the whole theme through Galatians and is this idea of flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit. And he, Paul says, this goes back to, all the way, go back to uh, Jacob and Esau, go back to the sons of, of uh, Abraham, and the son of the flesh persecuted the son of promise. And it's been that way since the beginning. And here we are, we're sons of promise. God promised the Spirit, we've received the Spirit, He promised the Messiah, we've embraced the Messiah, our sins are gone, we're living in liberty and freedom and love. We're not loving sin, we're loving God. And what's happened is, is now this conflict has come, the church is troubled, and Paul says, this isn't faith, faith works by love. Real faith works by love. Now what you have to get it is this, verse 14, verse 13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Here's the key. For all the law. Now did you hear what Paul said? For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus Himself stated it. I have not come to destroy the law, but fulfill it. The law and prophets all hang on this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, so mine is true. And love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now keep going, verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. In other words, when they came to Christ and got filled with the Spirit and got saved, they also got filled with love. They treated one another right. They were faithful to their wives. They honored their mother and father. They were honoring God. And they were loving one another. And sometimes not even being conscious of of this idea, well, I'm not stealing. If you love, you won't steal. If you love your brother, you won't steal his wife. You won't steal his cow. If you love your parents, you'll honor them. If you love your wife, you'll be faithful to her. If you love your neighbor, you won't lie against him. If you love yourself like you ought to, you won't be covetous. You will love God supremely. If you love God supremely, you won't take His name in vain. You won't serve other idols. You'll serve Him and Him alone. You honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And they were doing all that, loving God. But now they're biting and devouring one another. Hey, interestingly enough, that as they have had this emphasis on the law, and they're going back to obey the law, they're disobeying the law. They're biting and devouring one another. That's against the law. In the effort to keep the law... They're disobeying the law. Because the only way the law is ever going to be fulfilled is by love. And the only way you're ever going to get love is by faith. Through Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 16. Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I want to go back to a verse a Scripture, chapter 3. That's where I want to get to. Let's go back for a moment. Um... 
Let me quickly read it. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently, that is, portrayed, depicted, openly, crucified among you, set forth, crucified among you. He says, Galatians, when you got this gospel, you got it right, you got it true, Christ was pictured, depicted, and portrayed to you truthfully, openly. This wasn't done in secret, and it was done rightly. He says, this only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? Uh, if it is yet in vain. He therefore that ministers you, to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you. Doeth he yet by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? When miracles come among us, do they come among us because we go out and obey this law? And because we obey that law, God does a miracle? No. It's because we believe. The Holy Spirit, the miracles, the works of the Spirit all come as a result of faith, not works of the law. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him to, for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now here is the problem, if I can put this together by the help and the grace of the Lord. Here's the law. And the problem is, Paul says back in Romans, when people looked at the law, God said, and, and this is what the law does. The law doesn't tell you, the law doesn't look at you and say, believe. The law looks at you and says, do. The law emphasizes action. Doing. Working. So when people heard the law, they said, the law says, do this. So I got to do it. The problem at that point is, rather than seeking the law by faith, rather than saying, hey, God told me to do this then He will help me to do it. That wasn't the perspective. The perspective is, God said do it. I got to do it. And so they set out to obey the law in their own energy, in their own strength, by their own fortitude and by their own resolve. And any man that's ever set out to obey the law out of their own strength and resolve has always failed because Paul says this, if you are justified by law, you got to do it all. you got to obey it all. Notice what he says, verse 12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. And he said back in verse uh, 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You've got to do the whole law. If you're going to obey the law, you've got to do the whole law. And you've got to do it perfectly. Because if you disobey in one area, then you've violated the whole law. Because the law is a unit. And no man has ever kept the law perfectly. Because the idea is they don't seek it by faith. They seek it as if it's the works of the law. You'll find that back in Romans. And they seek it out of their own strength and out of their own energy. Not out of love to God. Not out of faith in God. But out of a sense of duty. I've got to do the law. God says do the law. And that's what happened. God came down on Sinai and said do this and do this. Thou shalt not do this. And they said we'll do it all. And God said oh, I wish they had a heart that really meant what they said. But that's it. I will do it. I will do the law. And when you emphasize you doing the law, you fail because you by and of yourself cannot keep the law. In order to obey God, we need the strength of God. And now Paul says, back to Galatians 5, he says now and bring us down, what we need is faith. And guess what? It's really faith that will fulfill the law because faith works by love and love fulfills the law. And the law that God was gave to us that was the, the 
laws that govern our activity and our, to between Him and to, between our brothers is the idea of loving your neighbor of yourself, loving God with all your heart. You can go back to Romans chapter 14 and 13, talks about it as well. That love fulfills the law. And faith works by love. And I want you to understand what happens. Now, let's go back to Galatians 5. Verse 16. Now they've started going back to their efforts to obey the law and it's caused them to fight with one another, bite and devour one another. Paul says, what's this all about? You're back to following the flesh and if you're biting and devouring one another, you're disobeying the law. So in your efforts to keep the law, you're failing. You're not justified because you've disobeyed the law. The law doesn't want you to bite and devour one another. Even the law calls for you to love one another. Law doesn't allow you to, to uh, turn against one another and slander and say bad things and turn, uh, use your liberty to occasion to destroy one another. So Paul says this. We've received the Spirit by faith. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth or sets its heart upon something different than the Spirit. Lusteth against the Spirit. The flesh goes in one direction, Paul says. The Spirit goes in another. The Spirit against the flesh. They're contrary one to another so you cannot do the things that you would. He says, if you're trying to be justified by law, justified by faith, you're trying to follow the Spirit, you're trying to follow the flesh, it ain't going to work. I'm telling you, it ain't going to work. That'll pull you apart. Flesh is going one way. Spirit's going the other way. And if you're in that kind of a battle, you can't do what you're supposed to do. You can't keep the law. You can't obey God. You can't honor God. You can't do what you want. No, you've got to get that battle resolved. You've got to walk in the Spirit. Crucify the flesh. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, verse 18. If you're led by the Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, if the Spirit is guiding you, and I'm going to ask you a question. If the Holy Spirit is guiding you and you are obeying and honoring the leading of the Holy Spirit, do you think the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to disobey the law? Never. In their efforts again to keep the law, they miss it. They don't keep the law. Paul's not against keeping the law. It's just how you get there. In the law that we're going to keep. Now, he says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. That is, you're not under that dispensation. The law is not our master. The law is not the one that we're striving after. It's we, we've got, we're living it now. We're not living it out of our own energy. We're living it out of the power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is helping us to live this thing. But the Holy Ghost, what's He do in your life? Now, He contrasts, and you got the works of the flesh. That means if you try to do it out of your own energy, and here's what's happening. You try to live it out of your own life, and I'll tell you what happens. You end up in adultery, fornication uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. And guess what? Every one of those things is a violation of Old Testament law. The law was against adultery. The law was against fornication. The law was against drunkenness. We're exhorted. Most of our scriptures we find against drunkenness are in the Old Testament. Murdering. Envying? The law is against that. But that comes from the flesh. That comes from your you trying to do it out of your own energy. You trying. Oh, there are a lot of folks out there say, well, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to do my best. What do they do? End up in adultery. End up in fornication. Paul says, get rid of that. But notice verse 22. But if you're walking in the Spirit... If you're honoring God and the Holy Ghost is living in you and you've got filled with God and His nature and His power, there's a nature, there's a fruit, there's a life that is produced from that. And what is that life? What's the first one? The very thing that fulfills the law is love. And how do you get that love? Where does it come from? From the Holy Ghost filling your life. What else comes? Joy. Peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. And get this phrase that we most of the time don't quote and get it clear out of its context. Notice, against such what? 
If you walk in the Spirit, you're going to have that kind of fruit. And if you're living that kind of life with that kind of fruit, guess what? You are not disobeying the law because there is no law against love. There's no law against joy. There's no law against peace. There is no law against long-suffering. There is no law against being temperate. There's no law against being patient. There's no law against being meek. There's no law against being self-controlled. There's no law against being filled with the love of God. No. If you do those things, guess what you're going to do? You're going to honor God's law. You're going to honor His law. Now, the question comes, and that's the point. Faith works by love. That's a very quick uh, overview of it. But that's the idea. Folks want to throw out law. Paul doesn't throw out law. Paul says, no, let's go the right way. Let's get, let's come by faith. Let's put our trust in God, not ourselves. Let's receive Christ. Let's receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost now is filling our life. And we're walking through the Spirit. We're walking in the Spirit. He's leading. He's governing. His nature is influencing us. His presence in our life has made the difference, given us new desires, a, a new passion, a new want, a hunger. The Holy Ghost doesn't fill you with a hunger for the world. He fills you with a hunger for the Word. He doesn't fill you with a hunger for the fleshly things. He fills you with a hunger for God and the spiritual life. And when you get that life, you chase after love and joy and peace. And that becomes the outworking of your life. And if that is your life, you're not going to be violating law. Now, given that kind of a scenario is what Paul is saying. But there's some folks say to us, okay, we got to answer this question. But Brother Woods, we don't observe. We're Gentiles. We don't observe. The dietary lies of the laws of the Old Testament. I'm not sure. I had some meat back there today, but I don't know what it was. It might have been beef. Whoever fixed the meat in the crock pot. It had a good flavor. Whoever fixed the meat in the crock pot. Uh, it might have been pork. I don't know what it was. Uh, but I had some uh, fried hot dogs for breakfast, and I know they ain't legal. <laughs> I know. <laughs> John, don't go there. All right? I know, I know that hot dog doesn't meet the, the dietary standards of the Old Testament. All right, so I understand that. Whatever, we don't even want to talk about what goes in a hot dog. All right, don't even go there. But the point, the point of it being, is that folks ask the question, but we don't observe the dietary laws of the Old Testament. We don't observe Passover. We don't observe Feast of Tabernacles. We don't observe Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Unleavened Bread. We don't offer sacrifices. Now, there's some parts of that law that people uh, talk about and think that we, we do a lot more than folks think we do. I mean, there's things in there. I mean, that talks about, uh, you know, not plowing with the... Uh, an ox and a mule or an ox and a donkey or something like that. Well, I don't know of anybody around who's doing that. <laughs> you know, we don't have to worry about that much more. We've got tractors. <laughs> but uh, quite frankly, anybody had any sense didn't do that anyway. You know, certain mix wool and linen mixed together. Those two, those two materials, anybody with sense don't mix those two materials anyway. They just don't tend to go together. We got so many synthetics today. Those are things that just by nature of where we're at, we're not violating those laws because we're not doing them. They don't apply to us. But here or there, I don't have to worry about whether I'm not obeying. I'm not disobeying them. All right, I'm not not following them, but they they have they have they were given for the time for Israel and where they were, and and in some sense they uh, they have passed out of that time frame. But what's the answer to that, Brother Woods? Well, the answer to that is this: Why don't we do those? Well, you have to look go back and first of all look at why those laws were given. They were given specifically to the nation of Israel to set Israel apart as a nation different than other nations. The Ten Commandments does not set Israel apart from other nations. Ten Commandments are required for every nation in the world. You will even find other nations that before the law was given at Sinai, it's why some people think that, that Moses was, uh, he was, came late in the crowd. Uh, there was this, the black steel of, oh my, the Babylonian king. I don't remember. Sorry, my mind's failing me now. 
But they, they found this kind of obelisk or whatever this, this, they call it steel. And, and there are laws and, and things that are getting on the, given there the code of the nation that are, are similar to what you find in the Ten Commandments, similar to what you find in, in the law of Moses. And they say, well, this predates Moses, so this is better than Moses. Just because it predates Moses doesn't mean it's better than Moses. The law came by Moses, but the law wasn't created with Moses. He didn't create it. He didn't originate the idea. I'm telling you, this Ten Commandments was written on the heart of Adam in the garden and Cain knew it was wrong to kill his brother. He murdered Abel and he didn't need anybody to tell him he was wrong when he did it. He knew he was wrong. Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that the law the Gentiles do by nature the things that are in the law. Having the law written on their heart and on their conscience. I'm going to tell you even heathen tribes that have, do not have any Bible have had no connection with Christianity or Judaism. They still have some sense of a moral code connected with the Ten Commandments and all. Even though they may not follow per, uh, exactly the marriage laws of God, they still have a concept of adultery. And that they may allow themselves five wives, but they know it's wrong to take that guy's wife. The Ten Commandments don't specifically prohibit it. Polygamy. Okay, that's things that come out of it. But the point of being is they understand and even that they, they may commit murder that we know that does violate the law, but they still have a sense of murder wrong. And, and they have some murders that they condemn and some that they allow. There still is a sense that within them they understand that killing of an innocent person, if it's unjust, if it's not, there's not a reason behind it, then it's wrong. Now, where did they get that at? Because it's written on their heart and their conscience by creation. They didn't get it from the Bible. It's there by nature. Now, you can shove it aside. You can push it aside. You can completely annihilate it too. But it is there in the beginning. Now, with that being said, where do we stand in reference to these other aspects? Because we do know there are certain laws that we are not keeping. Are the dietary laws obligatory for us? Well, I answer it this way. First of all, I go to Acts chapter 15 where that question was presented to the church years ago in the beginning because that was a major conflict in the early church when you got Jewish Christians and you got Gentile Christians and the Jews said you got to be circumcised and the Gentiles say, man, I didn't have to get circumcised to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I didn't have to get circumcised to get delivered from the sin. God set me free from my, from my idols. God set me free from my wicked life. He set me free from my adultery. He forgave me of this. He filled me with His Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are operating through me and He did all that and I wasn't circumcised. Then why have I got to be circumcised now? Why have I got to go back to that? And the Jew over here, because that's of Abraham. And he's giving his argument. It's tearing the church apart. So the council came together. We've got to fix this, fellas. There was a decision that came out of that council that's binding on us today. And they took the law. You can study it out. We're going to quickly look at it. Acts chapter 15, quickly. Acts chapter 15. And you're going to get it. It's going to come right out of the law. And you can study this out, alright? Acts chapter 15. There's a particular order that is given. And it's in the official. The, the list is of what to do is mentioned twice. It's mentioned the sentence or the, the decision that comes out of that meeting begins in verse 20. It's mentioned in verse 20. Uh, that's the general consensus. When the official statement is made that is sent to the Gentile churches, the order is given in verse 29. That's the order I want to read because that became the official decision that was put in writing and sent to the Gentile churches. This was their decision. And here's what they have to do. All right. Uh, verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Here's what they said we got to keep out of the law. That you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. Didn't have to keep circumcision. Didn't have to keep Passover. Didn't have to keep Feast of Trumpets. They went to the law and said, these are the four things. Where does it come from? Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. This is the law. The law said those things. We'll find it in the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, 
chapter 17. Chapter 17. Okay? You can read down through it. And I'm going to start chapter 17. Um, he tells them where to go to offer their sacrifices and whatnot. And you're to bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. Verses 1 through verse 7. I'm going to read verse 7. And they shall know... First of all, I'm sorry. Let me get ahead of myself. Can I have someone that will... Or keep your finger in Acts 15 and keep your other hand in, in Leviticus 17. Because I want you to go back and forth. Acts 15. What was the first thing mentioned that they had to abstain from? Meats offered to idol. Not meats. Meats offered to idol. Alright? Go back to 11, 17. I'm sorry. 17 and 7. Leviticus. Here was the law. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. After whom they've gone a whoring, this shall be a statute forever under them throughout their generations. He says, you got a place to offer your sacrifices. You offer your sacrifices unto God. You don't offer your sacrifices unto idols or unto devils. Remember Paul said that over in Corinth when he said in 1 Corinthians 10, he said the things they offer unto idols, they offer unto devils. That's the law. God said, I don't want your sacrifices, your meat that you're going to eat. I don't want it offered unto devils. That's meat offered to idols. That was in the law. And guess what? The principle applies to us today. And you can read the outplay of that in 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 8 of Leviticus 17. And thou shalt say unto them, Whosoever or whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offer a burnt offering and sacrifice, and bring it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation offered unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from his people. That's again part of offering unto, not offering unto devils, but offered it unto God instead of unto devils. Verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. What was the second thing given in Acts 15 and verse 29? Eating blood. It was from blood, which was the idea of eating blood. Comes right out of the law, the same order as Leviticus chapter 17. Now notice it's eating blood, not drinking blood. Drinking blood obviously applies, but it's whoever eats blood. Well, how do you eat blood? Well, oh, I've never eaten blood. No. Well, sometimes some folks do it in, in various forms. Obvious, the obvious of that is, yeah, if you literally eat blood, that's a problem. If you drink blood, that's a problem. But more so than that, to get it down a little bit narrow, the principle is God wanted them to cook their meat. You don't eat it raw. It's still got the blood. Cook it. Now, you can go and find your temperatures if you go on the Internet. We'll tell you what temperature at what temperature meat is cooked. It can still be a little pink and still be cooked in the blood out of it. There's now a scientific method for doing that. But I can tell you right now, modern science and modern dietitians will tell you eating meat raw is very bad for you. It is very bad for you. And they tell, the best thing they will tell you to do is cook your meat. Amen? Because the idea is eating blood. That will obviously involve drinking it. But he placed the emphasis upon eating it to tell us that cook it. Whatever you goes in your mouth, whatever form it is, cook it. Don't eat your meat raw. That is the th second principle. Third principle, chapter 17, verse 13. Whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, of the strangers sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of the flesh, of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beast, whether it be one of your own country or of a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean of the even, then shall be clean. But if he wash him not and obey his flesh, then should bear his iniquity. Notice here, the idea is he's got to, when he catches it, he hunts it, he catches it, he kills it, he's got to drain the blood out of it, so the blood's not in him when he eats it. What's the third requirement in Acts 15? 
If something strangles, you can't, you're not getting the blood out of it. Third thing, it's from the law. It is a dietary rule. If we eat it, we're supposed to drain the blood out of it first. If we kill an animal, we're supposed to drain the blood out of it, cook it, and then eat it. Chapter 18, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. After the speak unto the children of Israel, verse 2, saying to them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you shall dwell, you shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances, neither shall or ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach. Verse 6 forward gives unlawful marital and sexual relationships. What is the fourth thing in the list in Acts? Fornication to the Jew was unlawful sexual relationship. And it's incest. It involved the incest laws of the Old Testament. Homosexuality is condemned in that statement. Hey, that statement alone tells us we cannot accept homosexuality. Because the New Testament condemns it right there and it was decided by the Holy Ghost and by the church. And that is one, and you, you can find it uh, if you go in there. Verse 22 of Leviticus 18, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. That's homosexuality. So all of the incestuous, unlawful sexual relationships are forbidden in that one word fornication. The same order is found when they put it out to the letter from Acts 15 is found in Leviticus 17 and 18. It is the law that is obligatory for us in terms of that, that uh, and more than even just the ceremonial law in that regards. But part of the ceremonial law, the dietary laws we obey are given in Acts chapter 15. We're not being anything we want. But we are told to cook it. Now, he's not talking about vegetables, but if it's an animal, if it's meat, we need to cook it. Amen? That's what he said. Get the blood out of it. And then you cook it. Now, and uh, things strain, strain, get, the, get the, uh, the blood out of it and fornication. And he gave by so doing, he now places the incest laws of the Old Testament as an obligation to New Testament believers. And that should be the laws for incest. And that's the laws that we follow. Now folks, we go through all of that. That's, our, that's my first answer. You want to tell me what ceremonial laws I have to abide by? You want to tell me what dietary laws I have to abide by? It was decided in Acts chapter 15. And that's what was given unto us. That doesn't include the Ten Commandments. They've been there forever, written upon the heart. The dietary laws did come with the nation of Israel. That was new. Talk about tithing. Tithing wasn't a part of the law. Tithing was by faith. Abraham tithed before the law ever came. The law gave some regulations about tithes, but tithing was under Abraham, not the law. And I'm going to take you back real quick to Genesis, because what they really did was took us back before the law. Genesis, please, in chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God now says you can eat meat. In verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. God gave that to Noah. Before it ever came to Moses, God gave it to Noah and said, You can eat the meat, you just can't eat the blood. And that's what those two things of eating blood and eating things strangled has to, has to do with. Same principles was given there in the early part. Now, so that becomes our answer. When the New Testament gives us a liberty and says we don't have to keep, eat the dietary laws of the Old Testament, we just have to make sure we cook it and we drain the blood out of it. Now, if you want to do it, you have liberty to do it. If you want to make a demand upon your own life and say, I have made a decision, I am not going to eat pork. And I'm going to follow the dietary laws of the Old Testament. You have that liberty under Christianity. You can choose to eat beef and chicken. I guess they could eat chicken. I think so. I don't know if they had them birds or not. But anyway, they had some good birds. They're clean birds. Forget the rules for birds. But anyway, you can eat uh, deer. You can eat uh, cow. You can eat sheep and goat. 
but you can't eat um, can eat rabbits. You know, can't eat um, pigs. Obviously, they're buzzards and unclean birds. They had clean birds and unclean birds. There's a list of them given. But nevertheless, if you want to say fish, if you eat fish, you can eat fish with scales, but can't eat catfish. They don't have scales. You can eat. Um, Flounder, you can eat um, bass, but you can't eat catfish. Oh, wasn't it good the other night? Come on now, folks. You had that catfish and you loved it, didn't you? But you can't eat that. Now listen, my point is this. If you want to say, I'm going to follow that law, you have that liberty in New Testament Christianity. The only thing you're not allowed to do is say, everybody's got to do as I do. In that regards. You can't look over. I can't say to Sister Sonona. Sister Sonona, I have decided that I'm only going to eat fish with scales and I'm going to follow the dietary laws of the, Old, laws of the Old Testament. I believe they have health benefits and I'm going to follow them. And I think you need to follow them. If you're going to be a true Christian of Christ, you need to follow them too. I can't do that. I can put it on me, but I can't put it on her. I can make it a, I can make it a requirement in my own life. The, the New Testament gives me that freedom to do so. And I have no right to condemn. I, don't, I can't condemn anybody else. And nobody's allowed to condemn me. You are not allowed to condemn me if I do that. But I'm not allowed to condemn you if you don't do it. We're supposed to allow that kind of liberty. You got a question? So, even in the New Testament, like, you can eat like a medium rare steak? A medium rare steak. Now look, here's the best way I can tell you. God tells you to cook your meat. Modern science, modern dietitians is telling you to cook your meat. You can go on and do your research. I've done it. I don't remember what the temperatures are. There is a scientific process that now tells us that once meat reaches a certain temperature, it is fully cooked. I don't remember what that temperature is. It's probably different for certain meats. But you can check that out. I know what I do. I cook her till I know she's done. <laughs> I don't leave any room for doubt. And I tell them when they bring it to me in a restaurant, which is very rare that I ever get to do that. But uh, I say I want it well done. I don't want it choking and screaming when it's on my plate. When it gets there, it better be dead and it better be fully dead and fully cooked. And, uh, and I eat it that way. Yeah. I, I can't tell you as far as what constitutes medium well in this. I know I do well done. You can, dis, you can find out what constitutes fully cooked meat. I am telling you this. When God said not eat, to eat blood, He meant it. It applies to us. And don't eat the raw meat. Cook it. And you got to ask, well, how much do I cook it? Well, cook it till it's done. Now, you can find what's right to cook it till it's done. There, and I said we have some science to help us with that now. But the, I think that that's not a... I think common sense will tell you that. You won't have to... You can tell when it's meat. And you're probably not cooked. That's exactly right. That's, that's probably a good indication, brother. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you put the knife in and it squeals a little bit, it's probably not done. Yeah, that's a fact. Which is what evolution wants you to do. Because evolution says the animals basically precede the man. And that's what you become. And, and, and the reason God said to the life, that blood symbolized something. It wasn't just a health thing. The blood symbolized the life. And, and that life was to be poured out as a sacrifice. And when they sacrificed the animal to God, they caught the blood in a container... They poured it out on the altar to cleanse and sanctify, which would become a type and shadow of the blood of Jesus Christ that is poured out for our life. Then Jesus comes along and says, eat my blood, or, or eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> yeah, but it becomes a spiritual thing. 
partake of my sacrifice, partake of my body. Now, I wanted to say one more thing um, before I close. If I can remember now what I was going to say. Oh, I wanted to say something else in reference to that takes care of those, those issues and ceremonies. But the other issue that becomes apparent in the book of Hebrews, why, what about offering sacrifices for our sins? What about our offerings, meat offerings, and um, the offerings of animals that were given in the Old Testament? We don't follow that. Well, that's true. Or why don't we follow it? Well, let me give you a couple reasons. First of all, let me say to you this. We haven't stopped bringing our offerings to God. We still bring our tithes and offerings to God. And that may be offerings and tithes from your garden. That may be from your pocketbook if you get paid by money. It may be in whatever source you get paid from. But you bring your tithes and you bring your offerings to God. Amen? We're still doing that. We're blessed and we're, we're still bringing our offerings. So we haven't stopped giving tithes and offerings. But why aren't we offering sacrifices? Well, Paul says, number one, those were types and shadows. They were incomplete. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But the blood of Jesus Christ does take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats can't purge your conscience. But the blood of Jesus Christ can purge your conscience. There's no need on my part to go offer an animal when I have the real. When I have the offering of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, as bad as it may hurt your feelings... The offering of those animals is not something detestable and ugly. And in the millennial reign, you may be surprised to hear this, but in the millennial reign, when the Jewish nation is restored, the nation of Israel is restored, the priesthood will be cleansed and restored, the Lord will sit in His temple, and they will offer sacrifices to Him. Not looking to the cross, but looking back to it. They're not looking forward to it, but looking back to it. You say, what's the need? Because that nation is going to come to fulfill the law. They've never yet done it that God gave them to do. And they're not going to do it under David or Moses. They're going to do it under King Jesus. Israel is going to finally do what God called them to do in the beginning. And they're going to do it when the real king comes to the throne. Once they get in Jesus Christ, they will fulfill the law. And they will offer sacrifices. Early Christians, early Jewish Christians offered sacrifices. Continued in all their feast. Paul celebrated the Passover. He celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. He celebrated Jewish feast. Jewish Christians still do it, can do it. Some of them do it today. There are people today that call themselves Messianic Jews, the Christians. I don't have a problem with some of what they do, but I think they're steering themselves in the wrong direction. Look, if you want to celebrate the Passover, if you want to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and Thomas, you can do it from the perspective of seeing everything in relation to Christ. You can celebrate it. You can have that celebration. God does not tell us you can't do it. It's just not mandatory. And also, don't let it become the source of your righteousness. You must live by faith. Faith works by love. And love fulfills the law. So, I don't know. I hope I've answered the question. I had a question at noon. But the answer is Acts 15. The answer is Hebrews. The answer is 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4. All things are good that God's created, sanctified by the Word and prayer. And we can eat it. And we give the th thanks to the Lord for it. But when you go back to find, but that don't mean you throw out the Old Testament. All the laws that's there, if you live by love and the Holy Ghost, you're not going to want to disobey any of those laws. The laws of dress, no, it's true, we don't wear fringes in our garment, but the laws that govern modesty and sexual distinction still apply to us. We live by them. Why? Because they're reinforced in the New Testament. That's why. We live by them. Because they were not just law. They're true to nature. Our women have long hair. Our men have short That's nature. Paul doesn't say... The law teaches you that women should have long hair. Uh-uh. He said nature teaches you that. That's common sense, man. All right, I'm done. Clear as mud. Right, Angel? Okay, so you got it. Anybody have a question? Question. You're either tired or I explained that real well. 
If you're tired, if it's any consolation, I'm tired too. Let's stand.